Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Friday's webinar from Annika Digital. It's actually our first of 2024, so Happy New Year to you all. Um, it's myself and Stanley today, and if you've not met me before, I'm the founder and CEO of Annika, and I'm very uh, pleased to introduce Martin. Good morning, Martin. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, nice Martin's one of our regular uh, speakers. He spoke at a couple of our conferences and done a few webinars. In fact, this time last year, it was it was actually last week, we did our first webinar on chat GPT before everybody realized how important it was going to be. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing what a year it's been. And I bet it's absolutely revolutionized your life in the last year. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this was something that I've been a space that I've been working in for a while and I didn't quite foresee November 30th 2022 changing everything it, it absolutely did right so what we're going to do is we're going to do a poll first of all to allow a few more people to arrive and just a bit of housekeeping so the way that if you're brand new to an Annika webinar we get a lot of regulars hence we know that Michael comes every week um, but there's lots of regulars that we see every week um, but we do a poll just to let a few more people arrive. And then um, Martin will share his slides and take over. I'll be answering the chat as much as I can in uh, on the right hand side. Um, and then at the end, um, when uh, Martin gets the end of his slides, we're going to have a bit of a chat and a bit of a catch up. Um, and we'll try and answer any questions that um, that you have that I can't answer. Um, I'm also greatly into this uh, subject as well. And um, at the end, we're actually going to offer um, the opportunity of coming on a, a full day workshop, um, which is really exciting. So let's do this poll first then. So you should see in just a second, a poll appear on your screen. So I'm going to start polling now. And for the benefit of the video, um, I'm actually going to read the questions out because you will get the video later on at the end of it. And also, if you haven't noticed, the handouts are available top right as well. So please go and help yourself to those. So first of all, then, how do you grade your knowledge of AI for marketing and business? So um, I'm a complete beginner and not tried anything. Have heard of things like ChatGPT, but not use them. Have played with ChatGP or other AI, but don't really understand how to use it for work. I'm a fan and use uh, ChatGPT and other tools when I need it. I'm a regular user and try to keep up with what's happening. Um, I'm trying to be a specialist in AI and invest a lot of time and effort into its use. So um, at the moment, we've only got one specialist. Um, and we have got quite a mix of audience, actually. Um, so about 30% are they've played around it, but don't really understand how to use it and what the benefits are. And then um, a similar amount, maybe slightly, uh, yeah, slightly more than that, 35%. And then around 30% said, I'm a fan and use ChatGPT and other tools when, when I need it. So um, we've got about, um, I would say, uh, what's that? About 90% of the audience, 80% of the audience are um, have played, um, but they don't really necessarily understand it. And then there's only about 10% of the audience that really consider themselves an expert. So a nice mix there for you. So um, I think that's quite helpful. Um, so if I pass over to you to share your slides, I will be in the background, but what I'll do is I will um, just turn my camera off and then I can confirm that I can, you can see the slides. Yeah, they, they look great. You can see them okay. So I will disappear and leave you, and I'll see you in about 45 minutes. Fantastic. Um, and welcome, everybody. Um, today's session is uh, empowering your organization with artificial intelligence. And really what we're looking at today is what you need to consider when thinking about deploying AI, and this extends beyond ChatGPT, but we'll get into that shortly. Uh, for those of you that haven't um, met me before, that maybe you weren't on the, uh, on the webinar last year, or you weren't at Leicester Digital Live, my name is Martin Broadhurst, and I'm an AI and automation consultant working with organizations to help them improve AI literacy to deploy AI within organizations and teams. 
I sit on the editorial board of the Applied Marketing Analytics Journal. I'm peer-reviewed um, with an article on how to deploy AI into businesses, and I do lots of uh, speaking gigs and workshops on this topic. So, uh, yeah, strap in for the next uh, 45 minutes. Hope you uh, enjoy the session and feel free to stick those questions in the chat pane. Okay, so there has been an explosion of AI over the past year or two. And for a few brief days in November this year, the pages of the business press were filled with high drama surrounding the relationship between OpenAI, one of the biggest players in the AI space, and its CEO, when they suddenly and dramatically sacked the CEO and then rehired him just a few days later. Microsoft Windows now has an AI co-pilot built into it. Siri is just about to get a generative AI upgrade. Volkswagen announced that their cars are going to be integrated with ChatGPT. And this week, a Canadian pushchair manufacturer announced that a new AI-powered pushchair is being developed and launched into the market. So when I say AI is everywhere and AI is in everything, I'm not really exaggerating. AI is hotter than it's ever been as a topic. So this is a, a Google Trends graph that shows you interest over time in artificial intelligence. That is how many people have done searches related to AI or artificial intelligence. And this data goes right back to 2004. And you can see that over on the left-hand side, right the way through to 2020, 2021, it was pretty flat. There was a small increase. But then in November 2023, this happened. Sorry, 2022, sorry. Um, there was a massive uplift. And that was because ChatGPT launched. And what happened was, and you can see that actually, the, let me just get the um, my laser pen on this slide. You can see here, there was a small uplift because what happened around this point where my cursor is in early 2021 was the, the technology that powers ChatGPT, large language models, really got a bit of an upgrade. So there was a bit of interest and it started to uplift. But then November 2022, boom, up like a rocket, a five-fold increase in interest in the topic of artificial intelligence. And that was, like I say, because of ChatGPT. And ChatGPT was an instant overnight success in what was actually only a research project when it was launched by OpenAI. It was so successful, it managed to achieve 180 million users in the first 12 months of its launch. And it reached 5 million users on the first day of its launch. There was real interest in it because it made artificial intelligence and large language models completely accessible. If you could use WhatsApp, if you could use Facebook Messenger, you could suddenly use AI. And that wasn't the case before. It was a bit tricky to use artificial intelligence. Now, AI is being baked into everything. Generative AI, which is the type of technology that creates new things. So generative AI could be text generation or image generation like DALI or models like Midjourney. Any AI that creates something from a prompt is called generative AI. And that has exploded. Uh, and it's having real world impact, uh, not least on the share price of NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is the leading manufacturer of the chips that are used to run high performance artificial intelligence models. And they saw their share price go from $146 in December 22 to $531 earlier this week. So a threefold increase and then some. Um, so it's a pretty safe bet to say that anyone in the chip manufacturing game is in for a boom period as AI gets integrated in everything from fridges, pushchairs, 
and even your car stereo system. Now, I'm an AI optimist. I believe that the benefits of using AI are plain to see. However, not everyone is so optimistic, and we are talking about some of the leading experts in the field, even people working in the field deliberately trying to create the next generation of AI, what we might refer to as artificial general intelligence. You can think of that as the kind of uh, AI that can do everything, not just an AI that does text generation, but an AI that can control your whole house, maybe a robot that can interact with you almost like a, a C-3PO droid or something like that. Um, so people that are working on those challenges, principally uh, one fellow called Ilya Sutskova. He's the chief operating officer at OpenAI, or at least he was until the boardroom drama recently that I mentioned earlier. He's spoken on a podcast about artificial general intelligence, which is the stated goal of OpenAI. That's, their goal is to create this. He says it will cause economic destruction. And that basically is because of huge job displacement is what they're talking about. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, a leading AI researcher, he was called the godfather of AI. You may have seen this um, in kind of summer last year. He expressed concerns about the existential threat posed by AI, including its potential to spread misinformation, potentially threaten humanity, and has warned about AI's potential to replace jobs. So far, I recognize that I'm painting a pretty bleak picture. But it isn't all bad news. It can't be, can it? Otherwise, why would we all be pursuing AI or why would tech developers and researchers be pursuing AI and artificial general intelligence? But let's take a look at what um, AI is expected to do for employment. Actually, the picture's not super rosy here either. In fact, there's a report from Morgan Stanley that says uh, AI, generative AI, could be expected to replace 300 million jobs. But I like to think about this in a slightly different way. So OpenAI conducted some research looking at the impact of generative AI on jobs, on job roles. What's it going to do to the way that we all work? And they found that generative AI is likely to impact tasks within at least 80% of all jobs, particularly jobs requiring college education or a university degree. In fact, they found that approximately 19%, so roughly one fifth of jobs, will see at least 50% of the tasks involved in that job impacted by generative AI. So the influence of generative AI spans across all wage levels. This isn't just picking off uh, low skilled, quote unquote, low skilled jobs. This is impacting higher income jobs, which may even be facing potentially greater exposure. Um, and that's not to say that jobs won't exist. Far from it. They will be impacted, but it's not going to replace the whole role. Employees will use AI in their role or find that parts of the role that they do today, they won't need to do. It will be done entirely by AI and they'll be moved into a different role. Now, that's not the case for everyone, of course. Amazon has deployed over 750,000 robots in its warehouses over the past year, taking on repetitive tasks and working with uh, human employees. Amazon's testing new robotic systems, a system called Sequoia and Digit, aimed at increasing efficiency and assisting the human co-workers. Uh, and this is, without doubt, being driven by economic considerations, right, with robots contributing uh, to significant time and cost savings. And the future of Amazon's operations will likely see increased automation with more robots taking on more complex tasks, working more closely with humans. So all of this is to say that AI is going to impact jobs in the future. But right now, actually, the picture is quite positive in terms of what AI does for jobs, and particularly what it does for individuals because it can benefit us incredibly if we have just a little bit of AI literacy and access to very affordable, off-the-shelf AI tools such as ChatGPT. 
There was a study conducted recently by Harvard Business School and Boston Consulting Group that studied consultants' productivity when using ChatGPT with GPT-4, and they discovered some interesting things. One, they found that there was a significant productivity boost. So businesses using AI tools like GPT-4, the employees that were using these tools had a 12% increase in task completion. So they were completing 12% more tasks than their colleagues. And the speed at which they were completing them was increased as well. So AI integration led to tasks being completed 25% faster, which allowed for better time management. This also, and this was a, quite an interesting finding for me, they found that the results produced with AI assistance in certain tasks uh, were actually of a higher quality, with some people seeing a 40% improvement in the quality compared to those who didn't use AI. And this actually was found to be the case across all skill levels. So AI provides substantial benefits to all employees, enhancing average performance by 43% in below average performers and 17% in above average performers. So what it does is it helps close the gap between the best and the worst performers in a team. It brings those at the bottom up. It also increases the productivity of those at the top, but just by not as much. The research uncovered something interesting as well. They found that they, the employees using AI had these adaptive work styles. And they said that successful adoption of AI in businesses can vary from what they were calling centaurs and cyborgs, which suggests that there's a flexibility in the way that people use artificial intelligence assistance like ChatGPT. So what are these centaurs and cyborgs? Well, a centaur is named after the mythical half horse, half human creature, right? Um, they strategically divide and delegate tasks between the AI and themselves. So they see the role as um, where is where is this, or which, which tasks are best suited for, for me, the human, to just do it, and which can be handled by the AI. And they kind of outsource those tasks. They have this clear divide. So they maintain a clear line between human and machine tasks. Hence, the idea of the centaur, there's, it's, you know, there's a very distinct half. It's a 50-50 split between the two. <clears throat> um, so in practice, centaurs might decide on the approach or analysis to be used and then get the AI to I don't know, produce the graphs in, in code interpreter using chat GPT and handle the data processing. Um, they might decide that the human is better off doing the, the, the data preparation side of things. And they do all of the data prep and then put the data in where the AI then does the, the graphs and the, the data analysis. The flip side to that is the cyborg. And these people are more integrated in, the, in their approach with part human, part machine in their task management. They integrate AI into, into their workflow, intertwining their efforts with AI at the very kind of frontier of their capabilities. So they don't delegate tasks. They collaborate with AI at every step in the, in, in the workflow, right down to the kind of subtask level. Um, I very much would put myself into this camp. I have chat GPT open and other AI tools open all day, and I'm constantly using them for, for different elements of my work. Um, and yes, there are certain things that I would say, I know that is a task for the AI. So there's an element of centaur in there, but by and large, I'm constantly flitting between uh, AI and myself. So that's what they're saying. Cyborgs continually interact with the technology, creating this seamless integration between AI and human efforts. So they represent a complete integration of task flow with AI, constantly engaging with the technology to enhance productivity and quality. That's worth taking a moment just to consider why consultants at Boston Consulting Group, this is one of the world's top consulting companies, right? They, they are expensive, they are relied upon to get things right and to offer 
great insights and to deliver great work. How are they confidently able to use this new technology to carry out tasks at all, right? This is a very frontier technology. How can they rely upon it when we know about things like hallucinations, which is the idea that AI can make things up? Well, that's because of the power and capabilities of the state of the art models like GPT-4. So this shot, this, this, this shot, that's a, that's a, I want to cut that from the edit. Um, this chart shows the performance of large language models when sitting the multi-state bar exam. That's the exam that you're required to pass if you wish to practice law in America. So let me talk you through it. Um, this is a timeline and all of these bars represent a different large language model. And this is the score that it got on the multi-state bar exam. So you can see Da Vinci. Uh, so this is GPT-3. This is the first version of GPT-3. It scored about 35% on the exam. You can see it was basically just better than random guessing. Fast forward to when ChatGPT came out, which was using uh, Chat. Sorry, it was using GPT 3.5, so a kind of improved version of this one. And you can see that it was scoring about 50%. So it was more or less in that 50% bracket. Still not enough to pass. GPT 4 came out in early 2023, and you can see the improvement in its score. It was scoring around 76%, 75-76%, which would actually put it in the top 10% of humans that sit this uh, score, sit this exam. You can see here that the student average is around just below 70%. So scoring 75% would put it in the top 10% of all humans. And that's for some of the toughest legal exams in the world. And it's not just in law that we see these massive improvements. You can see here uh, the same thing across a range of domains from chemistry, physics, biology, history, the performance of GPT-4 on the AP macroeconomics and AP microeconomics exams was impressive. The model achieving the highest score of uh, five, which a, a score of three would represent a pass for a human. Five puts it in the elite level. These are U.S. college level exams, and it's smashing the pass mark with ease. They even passed a highly technical industry standard exam for cybersecurity with a score of 89%. So let's take a step back from all of this. Like, OK, it can answer questions in theory and take a look at what this means in practice, right? How it can be applied into your day to day. What does this look like for an employee? Well, if you think about. GPT-4 and ChatGPT as your very capable assistant that can answer questions across a broad set of domains, has deep knowledge about a broad number of topics. Now, it can't execute tasks, and sometimes the reasoning is off, but for the explanation of, say, complex things or giving you a range of different options for ideation, it can be incredibly good. Some of you <clears throat> may have seen this form before. This is a W8BEN E form. It's a form that le uh, foreign legal entities, such as companies from outside of the USA, they must complete when they work with a US company for tax reasons. Now, it's an eight page long document, and the language is arcane and impenetrable for a mere mortal like me with no real expertise finance, accountancy, or anything like that. Historically, I completed one of these uh, for a previous company that I worked for. And to get it done, I spoke to our accountant who completed it for a small fee. It was a, a 100, 150 quid, something like that. It was, a, it was a few hundred quid. More recently, I needed to complete one again. I was working with a new US client. And I knew I was in trouble trying to do it myself when I got stuck on page one of eight. But rather than outsourcing this to my accountant, who would have clearly done it for a small fee, it would have taken a few days for them to get back to me, I email them and they say, yeah, I can do it. It's going to cost you this. And then I email them back and say, yeah, OK, here you go. And here's the information you need. And 
you know, go back and forth. They fit it into their calendar when they can. And you know, a few days have passed by the time I get it back. And instead I thought, well, I'll get chat GPT to guide me. So I copy and pasted each section into the chat, gave it some context about me and my business. Chat GPT guided me through the sections. It honestly, start to finish, took me less than 10 minutes to complete. Roughly the same amount of time that it would have taken me to draft the email to my accountant and hit send and maybe read the reply. And I would have been no further along. So this is one small example. Right? That's a really small example, but a very practical example of how I used chat GPT just as part of my workflow recently. Now, you could say, well, hold on, that's deprived the accountant of a job, right? a small job. There was an economic cost there where there was an economic exchange that, that was lost. But it enabled me to complete a task in a fraction of the amount of time. I was able to send the form on the day that I received it. and I didn't have to wait several days to get it back to them. It was off my desk, out the door and done. So these are some of the kinds of efficiencies that AI can drive. Big tech companies are investing heavily as they know this better than most. In the last 30 years, you could say that it's been defined as having seen a dramatic reduction in the cost of information transmission. Whereas previously, Data required being sent via post or fax or radio or what have you. The advent of the internet and the explosion of the World Wide Web has seen data exchange go through the roof and the cost of transferring uh, information and data has dramatically reduced. The next 30 years will be characterized by a dramatic reduction in the cost of cognition. We're entering an era where knowledge, specifically the ability to access and apply extremely high level knowledge with advanced capabilities is reducing dramatically. Hence why those reports that I mentioned earlier say that jobs requiring college degrees are likely to see some of the biggest impact. And the thing is about this journey is that we are literally, we are at day one. The AI technology that you use today is the worst it will ever be from this day forward. It's only going to improve from here. So what does this mean for business? Well, there's a massive opportunity, a great opportunity awaits us. In the State of AI for Enterprise report published by Deloitte at the back end of last year, they found 94% of global business leaders, they uh, spoke to 2,620 of them, they said that AI is critical. Uh, AI is very important to their business success. And we're starting to see companies use it in some interesting ways. Everything seems a bit small scale at the moment, but when they start to crack this, it's going to get very interesting. AI can be used not just for generative AI as well. This is something that we must consider. AI doesn't just mean chat GPT. AI could be the computer vision technology that unlocks your phone when you use Face ID. AI is uh, fraud detection on your bank accounts. Spam filters. Spam used to be everywhere in inboxes, and then machine learning got involved and dramatically reduced the amount of spam that we all received. So here's some ways that companies are using AI in the real world today. So. First of all, BMW. BMW uses artificial intelligence and computer vision in their car manufacturing process to detect defects in the paintwork of their cars. The system uses high resolution cameras to capture images of the cars, which are then analyzed by AI computer vision to spot defects. This has resulted in a significant improvement in the quality of the cars and a reduction in the number of cars that need to be repainted. HSBC uses AI to detect anomalies in customer behavior and connections, as well as patterns in fraudulent behavior. The system uses multiple machine learning models to analyze huge quantities of data in real time. 
Harley Davidson in New York uses Algorithms Albert. This is an AI platform that performs autonomous media buying. So the AI system takes care of analyzing behavior habits, predicting optimal pricing for ad buys, and distributing the budget in favor of the most effective channels. All of that is done uh, autonomously without the need of a media buyer. And I love this example. This is a Six Flags, the theme park in America, has partnered with Google Cloud to introduce a virtual assistant powered by generative AI, uh, which is available then by the app and the website. So the app will provide personalized recommendations for planning your day at the park, while the website will use AI to answer customer questions quickly, reducing interactions with live agents. So you get personalized recommendations, and if you've got questions, they can be answered on the fly by the AI assistant. Now, I'm very aware that um, all of that sounds like big business, right? We've spoken about BMW, we've spoken about HSBC, we've spoken about Harley Davidson, we've spoken about Six Flags. These are multi billion dollar businesses. <clears throat> and the things I've spoken about are much more complex than deploying a $20 a month subscription for ChatGPT. It's not just big businesses that are seeing big benefits from doing this. I want to bring this back down to, to earth and tell you about a company called PathEdits. PathEdits is uh, a company that provides professional image and photo editing services, specializing in Photoshop services for e-commerce businesses, product photographers, and any business that needs high quality imagery. So they have a big team of image editing experts, graphic designers, and really what their job is to take an image, process it, and get it back to the client quickly. And they are pixel perfect in what they do. So effectively what they're doing is uh, clipping path services and things like that. Customers can upload images, specify their needs, and they receive a clear budget-friendly price uh, with uh, the images typically ready the next day. So they they have a team of people working editing images, and these <laughs> jobs can be quite complex, right? So effectively, what they're doing is is this: they're taking an image like that and then delivering the cutout. But that can vary in complexity quite quite dramatically. If I just we think about this image here, for instance. If you wanted to cut this out in a pixel perfect way, you've got to make sure that you've, you've captured this little bit here. You've got to make sure that you've got all the detail around the hair. You've got, is this a reflection over here or is that part of the product? Now, but that's quite an easy one to do, but that's what they're delivering. And they deliver them at speed. Now, it's one thing delivering an image like that, which might take 15 minutes. For somebody to clip out. But what about something like this with a crane where every single gap, all of the gaps in this image here and this part of the image up here, all needs to be clipped out individually by hand. This might take 15 minutes with a cost of a few quid. This might take a couple of hours with a considerably higher cost. Well, how do you get that cost to the client? Well, the industry has a standard response time for quoting, because there's many companies that offer this service. But the standard response time is around one day. So you upload your images, you get a response within 24 hours. Path edits were already operating with a response time of less than an hour. So they would respond within an hour, but they knew that this could still be improved. Because if somebody goes onto their website and uploads an image, that person wants a quote there and then. They don't want to wait an hour, even though if they go to a competitor, they're going to have to wait a day. Path edits knew that they needed to improve the speed of response. So what they did was quite smart. They knew they were leading business. So what they did was losing business. So they used Google Cloud AI Suite. 
specifically a tool called Google Vertex and the computer vision element of this. And they trained their own model and they trained it on thousands and thousands and thousands of images using their grading scale. So they gave the AI thousands of examples of simple jobs, medium difficulty jobs, really complex jobs, in order to get the machine learning system to be able to categorize the complexity of a job instantly. So you could upload an image and the machine learning model will say, that looks like a grade five complexity. That looks like a grade one complexity. And what they've done is they've been able to deliver a model that can provide an accurate quote in under a minute. And it worked upon rolling out the new system. Quotes were issued within 90 seconds, which resulted in a significant increase in conversions. What's more interesting is that the accuracy of the quotes generated was around 95%. Some jobs were underquoted, meaning that they were over-serviced, but the costs of delivering those jobs was more than covered by the increase in revenues and offset by the jobs that were overquoted but were still purchased anyway. So sometimes a job might be graded as a grade three, but actually it was a grade one and there's a bit of margin there. But for 95% of jobs, they were able to deploy this uh, and get very accurate quotes. Now, this is not a big business. This is not by any stretch a multi-billion dollar business. This is a SME based in Nottingham that is doing this. And they trained their own model on their own data and found massive improvements to their workflow. Of course, you don't have to develop your own custom trained models to utilize AI. It can be as simple as deploying uh, chat GPT to get a 19% uplift in productivity from your highest performers, for example. But when it comes to deploying AI in your organization, you really have two options. Do you build or do you buy? Deloitte's 2023 State of Enterprise report found that 65% of respondents were choosing to buy in. Um, that was either a package solution or they would rent something with a subscription model. Uh, versus 35% choosing to build in-house. Obviously, there was companies that were choosing to do a bit of both. They were building and buying as well. Most companies will start with a product off the shelf to tackle a specific problem or capitalize on a specific or very particular opportunity. Hopefully, you've watched this so far and thought, okay, there is an opportunity. I can see that the opportunity is really quite big and whether it's something small like deploying chat gpt to make my team more efficient or it's training my own model to, to to alleviate some of the pressure on a particular bottleneck in our workflow we can do something interesting with ai and if that's something that you're interested in doing well a few things to get you started start with some sort of internal AI audit. Do you have a strategy in place? Probably not. Have you given your staff any training on AI? Have you done any training? Going to webinars like this is fantastic, but could you benefit from an in-person training session? Could you benefit from buying a book on AI for business? There's a great book called, uh, Marketing Artificial Intelligence by Paul Reitzer and Mike Caput. If you haven't read that book, that's a great place to start. Can you educate yourself? Uh, if you haven't given your staff at least a little bit of chat GPT training, you're likely losing some real productivity gain. So that's something you want to consider. Do you have policies and procedures in place for using AI with your data? Right? There are risks, but there are also benefits. Have you considered, have you weighed up what data you might want to use? And more importantly than all of that, are your senior leadership team brought in to the opportunity of AI? Do they see it? Do they feel that it's real? Because if they don't, they will fall behind because someone at one of your competitors or a startup will see the opportunity and will capitalize very soon. We're at day one of this. The dust has barely even been kicked up in the air, never mind settled. So now's the time to make a move. So what do you need to do? You need to invest in training for your staff and for your leadership team. Take the time to upskill and prepare. You want to stay competitive. 
understanding how AI allows businesses to evolve and to how it can be deployed requires careful consideration. Yes, you can give everyone a chat GPT account, but how do you go about identifying a particular point in a process and deploying it like path edits? These are two very different worlds. There are risks associated with using AI. If you check the industry press at the moment, you'll see that the New York Times is suing OpenAI for using proprietary data in its training model. Um, however, the likes of Google, Microsoft, OpenAI have got uh, an indemnification for all of their customers where they will pay the legal fees if you face any legal challenge for using their tools in some situations. That's great. But what about personally identifiable information? What about the EU's new AI Act, which is coming into force? Might not affect us directly in the UK, but someone living in Donegal is going to have to consider that. What are the ethical considerations? There was a case recently in the SEO world where somebody used AI to scrape tons of their competitors articles and then they used ai to rewrite them and generated a considerably higher amount they stole all of that traffic traffic went through the roof they put this on twitter and everyone said you know where are the ethics of this right you've basically just stolen it but that's what a lot of people have been doing in seo for years take someone's content rewrite it slightly put their own angle on it they just did it with ai on steroids and like i say seo organic traffic went through the roof they did subsequently lose all of that traffic. That's a different story that we're not going to get into today. But there are ethical considerations. If you're using AI to make decisions, for instance, like quoting, right? Like using it to quote, you could put a bias in that system that means that if you want an instant quote, 10% of the time it's going to overquote you. You know, and that's, that's the price of convenience of getting an instant quote. Is that ethical? Who knows? Uh, it's a question. You have to consider these things, but also get up close and get hands on with the tools, get a training session that enables you to play with them to understand prompting. Right. Even without building your own models, you want to understand how to write a good prompt. That's something that Anne could talk to you about all day. And once you've got a handle on where you are now, and you've educated your leadership team. You then need to think about drafting some policies and frameworks, saying, how do we use this in our business? There's a great example of an organization that has got a starting point for this, for your business. It's the Marketing AI Institute. They've published a responsible manifesto for using AI in marketing and business. It advocates for ethical AI usage in business and marketing, highlights the need for transparency and accountability in AI systems, it stresses the importance of privacy and data protection, warns against the misuse of AI for deceptive practices and emphasizes human-centric AI development and deployment. And, and it is completely uh, open. You can use this. You can take this on a Creative Commons license and remix it, repurpose it, change it any way you want for your business. They've made it completely available. So go and find that. Finally, once the training is done, the policies are in place and you've got your guiding principles ready for your AI deployment, you've then got to choose your projects. Identify parts of your existing workflow that lend themselves to AI workflows. Where are the, bottle flow, uh, the bottlenecks in your workflows? Much like Path Edits identified the quoting process as being a point of friction for their prospective customers, and you identify similar bottlenecks in your workflows. These don't have to be systemic either. It doesn't have to be like that quoting process. They could be individual or the tasks that you or a colleague undertake repeatedly that could be done much more effectively with a simple chat GPT prompt. I know for myself, that's very much the case. And I've got a bookmarked library full of prompts that I go to when I'm performing certain tasks or certain parts of my role day to day. Once you've identified your projects, go and pilot them. Learnings from the early projects can be taken into future projects. 
analysis of what worked, what didn't, will help get more out of the next iteration and the next set of projects we choose to pick. I've spent a few minutes on this slide. There's a whole workshop dedicated to identifying AI projects that I run. It takes several hours to go through to understand which parts of your processes are good candidates and then making a plan to develop how to actually roll out and pilot the product the project so i'm not you know i don't want to make this i don't want to skim over this and make it sound super easy but you know start small if you can't do the full piece look at small things that you do day to day that could be improved with a simple prompt so there you go assess your ai readiness Invest in AI training for leadership teams and for your wider team. Draft an AI policy that reflects your organization's approach to using AI. And then get piloting some projects. There's no better way to get started than just taking some action. And that could be signing up for ChatGPT Pro and or ChatGPT Plus. In fact, they've just launched a Teams profile. Give that a go. Get some of your team members on chat GPT for teams and see how it improves their day-to-day -day work. If you're interested in downloading some resources that I've put together, you can uh, visit go.broadhurstdigital forward slash bio, where you can download some resources there. There's uh, some slides. The slides from this talk are available in the handout. There is a set of slides from another talk that I've given available in there. There is an AI playbook that asks and provokes you to consider some questions in the area of training, policies, deployment, software, et cetera. So you can download that. And if you're interested in staying in touch in this area uh, and want to know what's going on in the world of AI, subscribe to my podcast, Artificially Intelligent Marketing. It comes out every week. We are recording the first episode of 2024 today. That will be published over the weekend. Uh, and we cover all things AI and marketing. So uh, yeah, if this is your jam, if you're one of the people that says you want to stay in touch with us in the poll, then please uh, subscribe to the podcast. You can find it on all good podcasting platforms. Brilliant, that's brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Um, lots of things to talk about as usual. Um, first of all, um, could you please put your podcast link in, in the chat, please? I uh, certainly can. Yeah. Very useful. Um, and we wanted to just check the book that you mentioned. Claire thought she was very quick on the mark. She said she thought you said um, Paul wrote Rotterdam Mike Kaput. Is that right? That That is correct. Yep, that's the one. Okay, because she did put a link. Because I just did a quick search in Google and got like 10 different books because obviously yeah. this is a topic that everybody's talking about. Um, okay, so a lot of the questions were quite practical. So first of all, what I thought I would do is I'll stick up on the screen um, an offer, which is for anybody that's interested in a day's workshop with me and Martin where we'll do um, – uh, practical prompting, which we mentioned, and um, then Martin's going to show you a lot of the tools that he uses on a, uh, a day. We haven't agreed the agenda yet. Um, just to say that anybody who's on the boot camp will get this for free. Uh, but if any of you guys um, would like to, anybody that's not on the boot camp would like to attend, if you just click the buy now and we'll get your contact details and then we'll come back to you later. Um, but we're thinking of Friday, the 23rd of February. So, oops, I just noticed a typo, but never mind. That was done while you guys were talking. So that's what you try and do when you try and use AI to do something and then you end up doing it in PowerPoint. <laughs> you should see what they gave me, Martin. It was uh, just unusable as an ad. Uh, as soon as you added any text into it, it was a right pain in the bum. Um, Okay, the biggest question was about why people should invest in ChatGPT Pro. I put a couple of reasons in, but what would what would you why would you say? Um, and you did mention um, ChatGPT for Teams, and um, I just sort of curious. I, I was aware of that, but just a little bit of a history of why um, they developed ChatGPT for Teams and also ChatGPT Shop, which is all very new in the last couple of weeks. 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question about why why bother upgrading. Actually, you can use Bing AI or Bing Copilot or whatever they're calling it now. I can't quite stay on top of what they're calling it. That gives you access to GPT-4, which is the most powerful model. Uh, it also gives you access to DALI-3, which is the AI image generator. But it is a bit more restricted in terms of the volume of inputs you can have and Microsoft throws in adverts and things like that into the responses as well. So it's a slightly different experience. GPT or chat GPT, if you've not, if you're using the free version, you're effectively using, I, I liken it to a toy, right? It's a great tool. And if you know how to use it, it can be, it's like, it's like getting, you know, um, what's the best way of describing it? If maybe you've just left home for the first time, you've bought yourself a toolbox and you've bought a pretty cheap toolbox, but it's got a bit of everything in it and it will do the job, but doesn't do the job brilliantly in any area. If you put it in the hands of a professional, they'll make it work, but they'd rather have a more powerful set of tools. GPT, chat GPT free is very much like that. I can get good results out of it because I understand prompting techniques that enable me to get good results out of it. But GPT-4 is only available on chat GPT+. And I showed you that graph earlier that's, that showed you the, the results of chat GPT-3 versus chat GPT+, plus with GPT-4 when it comes to sitting the exam. One of them fails the exam. The free version fails the exam. GPT-4 passes the exam with a score equivalent to the top 10% of humans. It's just a much, much more powerful engine. It's like going from a, you know, a 1000 CC car to a sports car. It's, it's you know, it, that's the difference, right? There's a bunch of other features as well. So you get access to uh, DALI 3, you get access to code interpreter. There's, there's additional things that are quite useful. But really, fundamentally, it comes down to you get access to GPT-4, which is the proper state-of-the-art model. And um, I'm just going to uh, interject a second because lots of people have asked in about um, the offer that I've just put. It's also top right. It's not going anywhere. It's just going to the um, it's just going to the feedback form. That's because I didn't have time to set up a landing page prior to this. It, literally, we were talking about this before we came on air and said, let's do it. That's why we were late. Um, but if you click on that button, I will know that you're interested in it. Anybody that's doing our current skills boot camp will be invited anyway because it's part of your learning. So don't worry about that. You'll get an invite. Um, the other things I've had a couple of people message while you're talking about the next lot of skills boot camp. So uh, ignore the fact that it says in November because uh, it, it this is an old one. But if you click on this button. Um, it will be because you're interested in doing a skills boot camp, uh, which would start in March. And you will have to be based in Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, Rutland, Norfolk or Suffolk. So at the moment, we've got courses in those areas. We will also have um, further courses next year in Liverpool. And I am hoping to try and uh, get some additional areas area, areas. Um, but if you are interested in our skills boot camp, um, it, it might be worth clicking on this link as well. OK, uh, let's go back to the questions then. Sorry to interject with that. Um, right. Can you talk about, uh, did you mention chat GPT shop plugins or uh, teams? No. So um, plugins are likely going to be uh, closed down, sunset. There's a feature that they're not going to invest in much much longer instead they're going to be replaced by gpts which is effectively like an app store they've just announced this gpt store uh, and gpts are interesting because what you can do if you anyone can create a gpt and basically this is a model where you would say i want you to do this specific thing but you can give it powers and by that i mean you can integrate it with other systems so if you've got um if you've got a your own website that has an API connected to a service or a piece of software that has API access, you can connect that to a GPT and people can start using your software via chat GPT um, and via the GPT's action. 
that is some you in order to use gpts you need a plus account so that's another benefit of subscribing beyond that there is also the teams account which they've launched this week i've signed up um just a couple of days ago it's five dollars a month more expensive and you need at least two team members signed up in order to um to get it it gives you more protection with your data so any conversation that you have with chat gpt whether it's free or plus can be used in the training of the model going forward so if you upload a bunch of proprietary data that proprietary data is technically in the model in the knowledge of the model um so that's something that people recommend you don't do however if you want your sensitive data to not be going into the model training then you can use the Teams account. Um, you also get greater usage limits. So there's a cap on the amount of messages you can send because it's quite expensive to run these models. So you get an hourly cap or a kind of every three hours there's a cap and that's increased. I think we've been invited over to Prague to do a workshop, Martin. Um, one of my great friends and colleagues, um, who used to be in Nottingham at Experience, Experian has moved over to Prague and uh, he's uh, private messaged me about us doing a workshop over there, which is which is really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going over to Ireland soon to do one. I'm going over to Italy in a, in a few months and I was over in the States a few months ago. So I'm more than happy to go and spread the good word AI. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking about security um, and um, we didn't really want to get too much into the ethics, but what I think is really important is with the copyright case that's happening mm -hmm. at the moment with, um, uh, what was it? Is it the Washington Post or somebody else? Uh, yes, yeah, New York Times. Oh, New yeah. York Times, okay. Um, but also with um, the ability for you to either use plugins or um, with the Pro, you can attach your own documents. Um, mm -hmm. Then the, the, They're not really guaranteeing security or copyright, are they? I think that's one of the things that they're talking about with the Teams or the um, Enterprise model. But can you talk a little bit, rather than going into loads of ethical stuff, how you can protect yourself from not um, being charged with plagiarism or not having your own content um, stolen and reused. Yeah. So uh, a couple of, a couple of things there um, on the, how do you stop your data going into it? You can put a, you can put something on your robots file. Like you might not want a page indexed on your website. You can actually tell the GPTs not to crawl your website and not index your content. So that's one thing you can do. Um, if you've got proprietary data and you put it into chat GPT as part of a prompt, maybe you upload a file, be aware that it will go into the training model. So the way that you get around that is by having a teams account, a teams or an enterprise account and that will, that will stop that. Excellent. I've just sent up the review um, so people can um, give us a review. Um, that's great for, please mention Martin and myself, because we, we do try and, um, we do, do try and uh, do, uh, ask people for reviews on a regular basis on this, because we do spend quite a lot of time and effort and thank you uh, people very much. Um, we've hit 10 o'clock. Now, I'm not sure whether there's any more questions that we need to answer. Um, we will, Definitely um, put on a one-hour webinar on the same Friday, which will just be practical prompting. I'll do that one, but then there'll be the opportunity for people to join us for the rest of the day. And that one-hour webinar will be like the introduction of what's happening. We'll talk about some of these terms like chat GPT shop and chat GPT pro and stuff like that. And then in the afternoon session, um, what I'll get Martin to do is open it up to some of the other tools. Um, would it be worth us offering a course, do you think, on Mid Journey and DALI, a, a more of an image base? Because I'm assuming that you got all your images from your presentation from one of those. I, hand, I handcrafted each and every one of those every <laughs> day. I oh, know you're lying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If, if there's interest in it, most definitely we can cover Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, um, DALI. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so maybe we can do that as a follow-up 
Uh, brilliant. Okay, guys. Well, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, it's a great webinar for the beginning of the new year. Um, I'm not sure if Gurpreet's online. Maybe she can tell me what's next week. I should have asked her before, but um, <laughs> uh, Gurpreet, what have we got next week? Um, it's Ed next week covering GA4. Excellent. I think he's going to be talking a lot about all the new privacy um, and consent mode stuff as well, which is going to be really, really important. So um, please do join next week. It's going to be a really important issue. And in fact, we are quite worried about what's happening in the next few months because uh, Google's even talking about taking Google Ads accounts down if they're not complying with consent mode and uh, privacy policies. So this is going to be a massive thing for the next uh, next year. Oh, uh, somebody's asked whether your background is uh, AI or is it just uh, um, an image is that you This my, my my library. Um, <laughs> uh, no, this is uh, I created this using ChatGPT with Dali. Excellent, excellent. Brilliant. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much. We'll see you all next week and um, I'll, uh, I'll chat to you separately, Martin, but thanks again for hosting this week's webinar and uh, good luck with your podcast for today. I bet you've got a lot yeah, to I'm... talk about with uh, so much, so much, uh, so much. There's been so many launches since Christmas, hasn't there? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. When will that go live? Uh, it will, should be published. Uh, depends how quick we are with the edit, but it'll be this weekend. All oh, right. Well, that's quick. Brilliant. Bye, guys. Uh, you'll get the recording in about an hour. Bye. Thanks, Mike.